Powers game. Ahoy there, YouTube! I'm back again today for another game review, another special Kickstarter review. And today I'm very excited for checking out Saga of the Northmen from Minion Games. This is for two to four players, ages at say about nine, ten plus. It'll take about 30 minutes to an hour to play. And in Saga of the Northmen, you're going to be playing as Vikings. Marching around, uh, I think it's Europe, trying to have the most influence in various different territories, completing routes in this tug of war area control game. But is it good? Let's open it up. I'll tell you about it. All right, and then we're going to take a look at what you're going to get inside of Saga of the Northmen. First and foremost, we got our handy dandy rule booklet. It's eight pages, double sided, full color, full of pictures, illustrations, examples. It's very well done. It'll have you up and running in no time at all. So, in Saga of the Northmen, you are going to be fighting over these little yellow guys right here. We're going to call them plunder, but in actuality, they are victory points. You are going to be doing that by trying to gain control of various different areas and then also have the most influence in other different areas after you get done fighting. How does it all work? We'll go over the components, then we'll get a little bit into the gameplay. So component-wise, we talked about the plunder tokens. Those are the victory points. You're also going to have influence tokens, which are going to be these little guys right here. These are the, the heart of the game for all intents and purposes. These are where you are going, how you're going to be marking your influence in various different territories. If you look on the map, there are seven that are colored. Saxons, Normans, Danes, Magvars, Russ. Um, these are the most important ones, arguably, and these are where you're going to be placing your tokens when you first start the game, as you go through the game, I should say. You're going to do that by playing these influence cards over here, and the influence cards are going to come in the various different colors. And one thing you might notice is some of them are going to have ground troops and some of them are going to have water troops, and that is important. Also, another thing to note is the number in the upper left-hand corner. It will be between one and three. Three are obviously going to be the best because then you'll be able to place three of your influence on a spot like so, which means you're more likely to win that area. Now, another thing I want to mention on here is when you play these cards, you need to look at the bottom like this, because if it has some text down here, that means that a plunder token is going to go in that location. So if you played this card, what you would do is you'd put two into the yellow one. So you'd put two of your influence right here in my Mars. And then you would also put one plunder token in Africa, which means that Africa is going to be a little bit more appealing to take over. Now you're saying, uh, how do I take that over? None of these cards have Africa on them. Well, I'll get to that in a little bit. So we have our influence cards over here. We're also going to have route cards over here. And these are going to be things that will gain you victory points. So for instance, this is a Saxons one. If you complete it, you'll gain three victory points. How you complete this is you must have control of the Saxons area at the end of a round. So you must have the most influence there. And then also you must have the most influence in what is called Abbasid Caliphate, Caliphate which is down here. I'll tell you how you do that in a couple minutes, but needless to say, it can be quite difficult to do these sort of things. So these are somewhat difficult to complete sometimes, especially if you're butting heads with other people. Next, you're going to have your infamy counter right here. This is where you're going to be putting all your infamy. I'll tell you how that works a little bit later. But your infamy is going to allow you to do special abilities. So I mentioned you're going to be going in between three rounds. So it might let you save a particularly good card, like maybe a three that matches up with your route you need to complete. Uh, draw two objective cards and keep one, which obviously the more you have, the better. Uh, place a chieftain cube, which are these heroes right here. These guys, for all intents and purposes, are influence cubes, but they give you bonus tiebreakers. So, for instance, if you have four in Norwegians and the other guy has four in Norwegians, but you have a hero there, then he is the tiebreaker. Last but not least, you'll be able to play a time token, which is this guy right here. And I'll tell you how that works in a little bit. So I think we've gotten over all the components. Oh, last but not least, we have our first player token, which is pretty important in this game. So, I'll take you through a couple mock turns and you'll see exactly how this works. So when you first start the game, you're going to start off with X amount of cubes on your infamy card right here, depending on uh, if you how many players you're playing in the game and if you're first, second, third, fourth. Uh, it's all pretty simple. You'll see it in the rule booklet. Next, each player is going to get six influence cards uh, that you will be dealt and two route cards that you'll be trying to complete. So, for instance, we have two Danes cards, which means we really want to make sure we have control of Danes. Also, we want to make sure that we have, we're going to be able to gain control of Italy and Abbasid Caliphate. If we could do that, if we could do both of those, we could potentially gain six points at the end of the round, which would be fantastic. It'd be very difficult, though. So, let's show you how exactly how the game works. So, first player is going to go, and what they're going to do is very simple. They're going to play one of these cards down. So, 
Ooh, we need, we need Danes, but unfortunately we don't have any Danes cards. But what we also need to do is we need to make sure that we can take over Abbasid at the end of the game. So you know what? We might go ahead and play this green card right here. We may play a three Russ. So we play this card face up in front of us so everybody can see it. And then we are going to place three of our cubes on Russ like so. Now we check the bottom to see if we're going to put on any plunder, and we do. We're actually going to put a plunder, aka victory token, on the Roman Empire. So, boom, put that right there. And our turn is not over yet, because now we have five cards in our hand. We need to have a six one. So, you'll see over here, a la Ticket to Ride, you're going to have a row of cards that you can potentially get a card from. So you can take any one of these top three cards, or the random card off the top. But I see a two Danes right there, which is exactly what we might need. So we put that in our hand. We would replace this, and then our turn would be over. It's just that simple. Now, other people are going to proceed to do this. You're just going to continue to do that. Also, I mentioned earlier you could potentially play a Chieftain Cube, or now they're called Heroes. You have to do that when you play something down, so when you play a card. So for instance, next turn if we play this three Russ, we could pay, pay these three Infamy Cubes we got right here, and we could also place a Hero right there. It might be a little bit overkill, but it's something that you could do. You're going to continue to do this until all of the plunder tokens are out on the board. Once all the plunder tokens are out on the board, you are going to see who has the majority in each of the colored areas. So, for instance, if there were, if we had three on Russ and somebody else had two and somebody else had one of their cubes on here, the two and the one cube would go away and we would be the controller of Russ. So you're going to go around all the different spots on the board to see who has control. Once you've done that, you're going to move on to the next phase. Where you are going to move your troops out of the location that you have control of. So how this works is... Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier that you were going to be playing your cards face up in front of you. And as you continue to go through the round, you are going to start accruing a big old face up stack of cards. You're now going to go through those cards and you're going to see what your troops are. So for instance, let's just pretend we had three over here at Danes. Let's see if we can get a good example. Oh, Byzantines. That's even better. Let's say we have two at Byzantines and these are the two cards we have. This would mean that we have one ground troop and one uh, one ship. The ground troops can only go one space landlocked connected. So they could either go to Bulgaria or they could go to Abbasid. And we would only move one since we only have one ground troop. Obviously, we want Abbasid because we're trying, uh, hopefully, we're trying to get control of that one. But you might also want to go to some place that has loot tokens. So we might be like, ooh, but there's two point victory points on Bulgaria, so we might move over to Bulgaria. Anywho, the ships are going to move any spot that is connected that is connected by a ship so they could move to Italy they could move to Cordoba they could go uh, to any spot that is connected by water now you might notice this track over here and this track is very important because the Normans are going to be the first person to move their troops so if you have the most influence over in the Normans you are going to move your troops to one of these adjacent spots first and then Rust is going to do it. And then my Marsh is going to do it. Then Saxons. Then Danes. But let's just pretend that you really think someone is going to try and undercut you and take... Let's just say that by cra some crazy coincidence, there's four victory points on Bulgaria. And you think everybody's going to rush to Bulgaria. And you don't want to waste your cubes by putting there. Because as in, the, uh, as in before, if you have the fewest amount of cubes there... If you have less cubes than the person who has the most, you don't get anything. Your cubes go away back to your infamy card. So you want to make sure you have the majority. What you can potentially do is you can purchase a timer. How that works is, is let's just say you are heavy in the rust. So you have four in the rust. When it comes time for you to move your cubes, you can say, all right, I'm going to purchase the timer. You put it right here, and then my Mars move, Saxons move, Danes move, everybody else moves, and then it comes back to you. So you'll be able to see exactly where everybody went out on the board, which gives you a huge strategic advantage. You fight the battles, aka you see who has the most influence in a particular uh, spot. Whoever does is going to get all the plunder on that spot, and then all their cubes are going to go back into their um, just their, their supply of cubes. 
If you lose that battle, your cubes go onto your infamy card where you'll be able to use them later. You will then rinse, wash, and repeat over two more rounds, but the thing is, as you go into the second round, you lose all your cards unless you spend influence to get cards. This is also the time that you can potentially purchase more of these or turn in your route. So for instance, if you were able to successfully have successfully captured Danes and you had the only cubes left on Califate, then you would then flip this over and say, hey, I got three victory points. You tally that up at the end of the game. You go through three rounds. At the end of the three rounds, whoever has the most victory points combining plunder tokens, uh, these cards right here, and then one last special condition is going to be the winner of the game. The last special condition is called the Infamy Point Bonus. Whoever has the most cubes left on their Infamy Point card is going to get a special bonus uh, that is normally, one, I think it's one victory point plus however many routes you completed. Tally up the points, and whoever's most points will be the winner of Saga of the Northmen, and that in a crazy jumbled nutshell is how the game is played. Alrighty then, Saga of the Northmen from Minion Games. What are my final thoughts? Let's go the pros, let's go over the cons. First on the con side, the game is not going to be for everybody for a couple different reasons. Two to four players, very restricted player count. Also, the theme doesn't come across very well at all. You know, you're not really going to feel like you're Vikings and you're going into areas and pillaging and doing all this cool stuff, which is unfortunate. It's much more of a mechanical game. As you might have mentioned from the middle part, it's a lot of mechanisms just kind of uh, strapped together. Now, they strap together very well, as I'll talk about the pros, but that is something that I did want to mention, that the theme does not shine. Uh, another con that I have with this game is I worry just a teeny bit about the balancing in a two and four player game. So in this game, you're going to be playing three rounds. You always play three rounds. So in a three player game, everybody's going to get a first player turn. You're going to be the first player once. Uh, in a two and four, that's not the case. And going first is very valuable. Having that first player token is incredibly valuable because it gives you the leg up on tiebreaker advantages. Now they try and mitigate this by having uh, by starting with more or less infamy cubes and also by having the heroes which can be the first tiebreaker over this but it is something that I did want to mention not a deal breaker but something that I worry about just a teeny bit. Um, other cons I have with this game and this is the kind of game we're going to be doing the same thing just over and over and over again. Uh, you play over three rounds and the rounds feel very similar. Yes, you might be going for different locations and you might be getting different cards and you lose all your cards so you start with the new hand of cards. But it is something that I did want to mention that it is repetitive in that aspect where you're just going to be playing three rounds and the rounds are going to be very same. Uh, artwork wise, the artwork, it's a little bit dark and gloomy, but I guess Vikings were dark and gloomy. So that is a your mileage may vary kind of thing. Any other cons I have with the game? Oh, randomness with the cards you draw. That can be frustrating if you get like this really terrible hand or maybe you get a really good hand, but it's of places that you don't need to conquer. That can be quite frustrating, but that's just the nature of the beast. And luckily, as you progress through the game, you're going to be able to draw cards and slowly weed out those bad cards that you have in your hand. That's all I got. Saga of the Northmen is a really good game. I really enjoy this game, and if you're in the market for a two to four player game, I definitely can recommend this one. And I like this game, uh, I mentioned this in the cons, that it's just a mishmash of mechanisms, but I actually like that. There's this really cool area control tug of war, not just once, but twice. So you, you get the initial tug of war, the area control, when you're laying down the influence tiles. And you're like, all right, I have three here, he has two here. And that creates this great sense of tension because you're like, oh man, I think, what if he has another card in his hand? I really need to see if I can get another green card so I can play it there. And I like that aspect. But then the second tug of war is really fun as well when everybody clears their cubes off the board unless, except for the winners who won the seven colored uh, countries. And then everybody starts moving their troops to these unoccupied areas and you're like oh should i go for plunder tokens or should i try and go for my victory point route condition and you know you're coming up next and you're like oh do i want to spend my infinity points to potentially wait around because you can put the timer down and you get to wait until it comes back to the next time uh, i like that aspect a good deal it was really interesting uh, I also liked, I complained a little about a little bit about it, but I like how the first player gets the tiebreaker because as the first player, this definitely impacts how you're going to play because you look at the board in a completely different way where you're like, all right, I have this tie here, I have that tie here. It changes how you play the game, and I like that. Another thing I liked about this game was when you lost, it wasn't too punishing because you get to put all your cubes back onto your infamy card. Whereas if you win battles, they just go into your supply. If you lose, they go into your infamy, which gives you a little bit more power so you can hold onto your cards until the next round. 
draw more of the route cards, place heroes, place timers. I like that aspect a good deal. Um, overall, Saga of the Northmen is a really enjoyable game. If you routinely get two to four players to the table, and yes, it does play well at all three, uh, two, three, and four players. Uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier how I worried a little bit about the balancing with the first player uh, marker, but trust me, it's pl it plays well at all the different player counts. Still had fun with it. Overall, Saga of the Northmen, very enjoyable game. Highly recommended if you play two to four players. And if you're looking for a game that's more of like a gateway plus S kind of game, maybe on the same uh, weight of Small World. So that is Saga of the Northmen from Minion Games. If you enjoyed this review, please be sure to click on the subscribe button down below and comments below. Let me know what is your favorite Viking-themed thing. Anything Viking-themed. For me personally, uh, oh, wow, there's, there's not too many things I can think of. Uh, I think it was that cartoon, that, that comic strip cartoon that was in the Sunday newspapers. BC, I really enjoyed... B Wait, was that about Vikings? I don't know. It was in the Sunday papers. I really enjoyed that comic strip. But what is your favorite Viking-themed thing? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for your time, YouTube.